I hope we understand just how true that song is and the truth that it brings to our attention. Because let me tell you something, there's not a one of us in here tonight believes what we believe because we've seen Jesus. Not a one of us have seen him. There's not a one of us that has seen God. There's not a one of us that was there whenever the Red Sea parted and became dry ground. There's not a one of us that was there whenever... Jesus come out of that tomb and ascended into heaven. We don't believe because of what we see. We walk not by sight, we walk by faith. There was a woman that walked into my office today and she was burdened down and she said that she called and got, was getting counsel from a friend of hers last night. And she said, and that friend of hers said, you know what, it's amazing to me that you can have great faith for other people, but you can't have that faith for yourself. And she said, Preacher, what's wrong with me? And I said, Well, the only way I know to tell you how to build your faith, I can't tell you what's wrong with you. But the only thing I can tell you on how to build your faith is to start reading this book. I said, Daily, you need to start reading this book. I said, And as a matter of fact, you probably need to start taking and making a journal. I said, Now don't read it to build your Sunday school lesson from. And don't read it in order to get something else that you've got to do at church or in some kind of committee you're on, but each and every day you take it and you start reading this book paragraph by paragraph. And don't read it like a newspaper, but just take it paragraph by paragraph and just begin to ask God, God, what is it that you're saying to me? What are you teaching me? What are you showing me about myself and about yourself? I said, and, and after a while, those things will come home to you. There's only one place you build your faith, and that is you must believe every line and every word. Amen? This is the Word of God. And so it's not just something for us to pick up as we go out the door to a church service. It's something that we need to pick up every single day and allow God to feed us and to grow us and to mature us. Thank you for that song. If you have your Bibles, let's raise them together. This is the Word of God. It's the power of God. It's so powerful it reveals the lostness of all mankind. 
But also, this powerful word is precious enough that it reveals to lost people that they can be saved, but only through the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ, His death, His burial, His resurrection, and His shed blood. And then for those of us who are born-again Christians, we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God who daily encourages us and inspires us to take this book, to open it, to read it, to meditate upon it, to hide in our hearts, and then to take those truths that God teaches us from His Word and apply them to our daily lives. And when we do that, we live in obedience to God. And when we live in obedience to God, we have victory as we walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Take your Bibles one more time, if you would, please, and turn with me over to the epistle of 1 Peter. 1 Peter, and let's look at chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Part of this we've already dealt with in another message just last uh, uh, Wednesday night. But tonight we're going to be looking at another message in these verses and adding a couple verses to it. Begin at verse 18, it says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfringed love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grace, and all the glory of man is the flower of grace. The grace withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Some years ago, hasn't been really all that long ago, it's been with probably within the last five or six years, there was a uh, religious service that was being conducted at the uh, Golden Gate Exposition out in San Francisco, California. And, and those who were attending that religious service quickly uh, became aware that the minister that was delivering the main address that evening was not completely orthodox, was not completely fundamental in his preaching and in his teaching. Although he was a very gifted speaker, he began in his message to direct most of his thoughts against the power of the blood of Christ. That's going on in a great way within our day and time. Uh, people don't want the blood no more. And this preacher was speaking against the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. One dear lady that was present that evening stated that when his uh, liberal message ended, that something very wonderful and very potent happened. She said that there was a little timid elderly lady who stood up, stood up in the midst of that crowd and softly began to sing a great old hymn that was written many, many years ago by William Cowper. She did so as a touching rebuttal to the remarks of that very liberal preacher. As she began to sing the words of that old, old hymn, a hush fell over that assembly as they heard those very faint but very familiar words there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Before that dear little old lady could begin the second stanza, approximately 100 people rose to their feet to join her. And by the time she reached the third verse, nearly a thousand Christians in that place all over that audience were singing that blessed song of faith. The triumph, thrilling words rang out loud and clear. Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. 
Many were very deeply moved that evening as that humble little believer stood up for her Lord and Savior and took her stand for the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We live in a very sad hour because in our pulpits today, many of them, the blood is no longer preached by many of those who are professors within many of our theological uh, seminaries, the blood is no longer taught. We have come to the place now where many people say that uh, there is no need for a bloody religion, that there is no need for such superstition, that there is no need for such gore. My friends, I want to tell you something. Salvation, what you and I enjoy, can only be purchased, and we'll look at this more in just a moment, only because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? We live in an hour in which many, both within and without the church, see no need for that old-fashioned, Bible-centered, blood-bought salvation. They say things like this, man doesn't need the blood in order to be saved. Today, we live in a time when many mainline denominations have uh, even moved uh, from uh, proclaiming that type of a message to proclaiming a social gospel instead of a, a gospel that proclaims salvation through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some have even gone so far as to remove songs dealing with the blood from their liberal hymnals that they're publishing in this day and time. L listen to, to this particular quote of a female theologian, a lady by the name of Dolores Williams. And here's what she says, quote, I don't think we need a theory of atonement at all. I don't think we need folks hanging on crosses and blood dripping and weird stuff, unquote. That's what one of our uh, theologians, a woman, a liberal theologian, is teaching her students at Golden Gate Theological Seminary. Well, you know what? It really doesn't matter what Miss Williams and others of her variety think. What matters is what Almighty God has to say. Isn't that right? God says that without the shed and the blood, there is no remission of sin. And God's the one who said it. And I'm just like that song that uh, Loretta just sang to us. I believe every line and I believe every word, don't you? I believe it is necessary. Ju just as a body is emptied of blood and it becomes a corpse, so is faith. Faith is, is dead when it is devoid of the cleansing blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you realize that? When, when you take the blood out of Christianity, my friends, there is no Christianity. When you take it away from your faith, believing that, that you are saved under some kind of a, a faith that no longer requires your sin to be paid for. Last night, as we were in a home, I had to take time with a very young little girl and to let her know that what sin she had been saved from. I had to let her know that she had been saved from the sin of lying, and she is a liar. She's human, amen? I, I had to let her know that she hadn't been saved from the sin of being a bad little girl, and just like all of us, at times she is a bad little girl. But I had to let her know that she was saved from the sin that she inherited from Adam and Eve that was brought down to every human being and that sin was rebellion against God and that rebellious nature against God is what causes us to be born in this world separated by God. And that's why Jesus died. He died that he might reconcile mankind back to Almighty God. Reconciled means to bring back together. And God wants that. And that's just like we preached last, last uh, uh, Wednesday night. God foreordained that. He knew that before man was ever created, he knew before the foundation of the cosmos that man was going to need a Savior to reconcile sinful man back to holy God. Isn't that right? And not only did he foreknow that, but he foreplanned it. It wasn't a plan that just cropped up. It was a plan before the very foundation of the world that the Lord Jesus Christ would die and shed his blood, my friends, that we might have the forgiveness of our sin of rejection and rebellion against God and be brought out from the bondage of being in sin to Satan and to be brought into fellowship and relationship with Almighty God. 
Robert Lowry got it right when he penned the old, old song that we all know so well, Nothing But the Blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So tonight, as we continue our, our study through this first epistle of Peter, I want you to look here with me tonight in, in chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, at a message that I would entitle, Nothing But the Blood. Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. I want to, I want to share with you three things that can only take place because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, if you look back at verse 20, I want you to see that nothing but the blood can produce a Savior. Nothing but the blood can produce a Savior. In verse 20, again, we come to that, that same phrase that we looked at last Wednesday night, and look at what it says. It said, Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Now, right here, as we did last week, we, we are given the thought about, being, about God foreordaining the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, of God foreordaining before the very foundation of the world that man would need a Savior. This, as, as we have already spoke of, tells us about God's foreknowledge and about God's foreplanning. And as we told you last, last Wednesday night, and as you already know, before the, the cosmos, before the world itself was ever created, God knew that mankind would need saving. And God planned that for, that for a Savior to, be, to come into this world that man might be saved. L listen to what we're told over in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8. It says, then, and that all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Friends, listen, even in, book, in the book of Revelation, God talks about his son Jesus being slain before the foundation of the world. God the Father foreknew and foreplanned that his son, Jesus Christ would be man's Savior. And the only way that could happen was for Jesus to shed His blood. He didn't just claim that title for Himself. He had to purchase that title. And my friends, He was foreordained to be a Savior, to be a Redeemer, to be the one that res would rescue mankind. And in order for that to take place, innocent blood had to be shed for guilty blood. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus accomplished many things as you'll study the Word of God. He accomplished many things during His walk on earth. We're told that Jesus, being God, became flesh. We're told that over in John chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 14, and again over in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. And when He became flesh, when God put on flesh and came into this world as the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus accomplished so many wonderful and great things. Just thinking about the Old Testament, just listen to the things that he accomplished that was prophesied in the Old Testament. He, he accomplished the fact that he was virgin born as it was foretold over in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. He was also born in Bethlehem. A designated place that was foretold in, in the book of Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. He was also of the seed of David, which was foretold over in the book of Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 5. He also was a man of sorrows, and this we see over in the New Testament in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 20. And then also this was foretold that he would be a man of sorrow in the book of Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 3. He was also said to be a man of compassion. That was foretold in Isaiah also, chapter 42 and verse 3. Along with these fulfilled prophecies, listen to what we're told in, in the New Testament about Jesus. Jesus lived a sinless life. He never one time committed a sin. You'll find that in 1 Peter 2, verse 22, and 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20, 21. He also taught a better way to live over in the Sermon of the Mount. That's what that's all about. Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 48. And then also, Jesus was zealous in order to, about defending the truth of God by cleansing the temple. You remember when he walked into the temple and he said, Have you not heard my, my house is to be a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves? 
You'll read that over in John chapter 2, verse 15. Jesus was always on the side of right. He perfectly modeled God before man. And we're told this in John chapter 14 and verse 9. As a matter of fact, all of the things that Jesus did when he walked in this world as a human being, Jesus did so many things that John the Apostle declares in his writings that the world itself is too small of a gathering place in order to hold all the books it would take in order to write down everything that Jesus did in the short 33 years that he lived in this world. You'll find that in John chapter 21 and verse 25. But... You know what? Jesus never became the Savior of mankind until He climbed up Calvary's mountain and He laid Himself down on the cross and was nailed to that cross and shed His precious blood. All those other things didn't make Him a Savior, but when He died on Calvary's cross and shed His blood that your sin and my sin and the sin of all mankind might be forgiven and reconciled unto Almighty God, then and only then He became a Savior. Amen? Listen, my friends. It isn't the life of Christ, nor is it the teachings of Christ that saves a man or woman's soul from hell. It is His blood and that alone, as we're told over in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22. In Jesus' death, Jesus became our Savior. John 15 verse 13. So, the blood is important. Nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood. How appreciative tonight are you for the blood? If you, if you know Jesus tonight as your Savior, it's all because He shed His blood 2,000 years ago on Calvary's cross. Did you know that? Do you realize that if Jesus hadn't died, you would not find Jesus' name in this book as the Lamb of God. You wouldn't find Jesus' name in this book referred to as the Rose of Sharon. Do you realize you wouldn't find Jesus' name in this book as the one who was the Savior of mankind? If Jesus had not died, if He had not shed His blood, my friends, let me tell you the fact of it all. You and I would not have a Savior. Because without the blood... There is no Savior. Nothing but the blood can produce a Savior. But secondly, look with me if you would please, at verses 18 and verse 19. Nothing but the blood not only produces a Savior, but nothing but the blood can purchase the sinner. Verse 18 and verse 19 says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed, you weren't purchased, you weren't paid for, you weren't bought out of your sin with corruptible things. Now what are corruptible things? It's those things that we try to use all the time to make ourselves right in God's sight. Isn't that right? We, we try to buy our way in by giving and doing, and look what I've done. Well, i got news for you. Your silver, your gold will not stand the test of getting your sins forgiven in the sight of God. It's the works that we do. It's those things that we do. Well, well, look how I have served the Lord. Look at what I've done for the Lord. And thank God for people that will, will financially support the work of God. Thank God for people that will commit themselves to take on different tasks and to do the jobs within the church. But i got news for you. The Word of God says, Not by works, lest any man should boast. My friends, do you realize if you and I got to heaven because we had enough gold to pay our way in, if we had enough silver to pay our way in, do you realize if we got to heaven because we did so much great works that God had to let us in, do you know what heaven would be like? It would be one of the worst places in all the world because everybody on the street of gold that was walking around there in eternity would only be a bunch of braggarts and that's all. Look at what I've done. And I don't know about you, I get sick of being around a bunch of braggers, don't you? When you get around one, you can't wait to get away from them, can you? You know? There's nothing wrong with being proud of what you've been able to do. That's good. But whenever you think, my friends, that you're the only one that, that does anything great, what a sad state, you are, sad state you are and how sickening you are to the rest of humanity. You hear me? 
So it's not that. He says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with works nor with gold that you bought your way in from your vain conversation, from your sinful life, and that sinful life, he says, which you received by tradition from your fathers, you inherited it from your father, who inherited from his father, who inherited from his father, who inherited from Adam and Eve. It's passed down to every single one of us. But we are redeemed, not by silver nor gold, not by anything that we've done, but we are redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Amen? Friends, not only do we see that nothing but the blood can produce a Savior, but nothing but the blood can purchase a sinner. Nothing but the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ can pay for your sin and my sin and the sin of every man, woman, boy, or girl. There's not but one way, and that is by way of Calvary. Amen? What's that old song? It says, some through the waters and some through the flood, but all through the blood. Isn't that right? Thank God. Amen. Listen, verse 8 declares to us that redemption is a reality. Isn't that what it says? It says in, in verse 8, For as much as ye know that you were not redeemed. So redemption's a reality, is it not? You, you can truly be saved, can you not? You know that. You believe that, don't you? We can be redeemed. We can be reconciled. But you know what that word redeemed means? It means to be liberated by the payment of a ransom. You remember when we talked about the other night? That Jesus' death, His shed blood, was a payment. It was a payment, one of ransom. And my friends, that's what the word redeemed means. It means that we have been liberated. We have been set free from the power and the penalty of sin. And what is the penalty of sin? For all that sin are going to die. Isn't that right? For the wages of sin is death. Isn't that right? And we've been liberated from that. We've been redeemed from that. We've been set free from that. And what is it that set us free? Nothing but the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This gives us the truth that sinners, and friends, listen, let me remind you, I know you already know this, but I can't take the chance that you just might be blind to it, okay? Maybe you fooled yourself in the last 24 hours, but I want you to understand, my friends, the truth that sinners, and we are all sinners, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, amen, that we are all sinners, that every one of us needs redemption, amen. We sit in the house last night with a little girl and with her mother, and you know what? That little girl confessed that she needed saving and her mother, who was much older, confessed that she needed saving. Take your mind and go back to the scene on Calvary's mountain when the three crosses were already dropped in those holes. On one side was a thief, on the other side was a thief, and in the middle was Jesus. Amen? And my friend, as he hung there between heaven and earth, at his feet was the lady who gave physical life to him. A lady by the name of Mary. From the cross, he said several things. But one thing that he did from the cross was he spoke to that woman who in that life was his mother. And what he said to her is very, very important. Because when he spoke to her, when he acknowledged her, when he recognized her, he did not say, Mother. He did not say, Mama. He looked at her and he said, Woman. He completely separated himself from her being his mother and giving him physical life. Why? Because at that moment, that mother didn't need a son. That mother didn't need a baby. That mother, just like every other human being that stood around that cross, needed a Savior. Needed a Savior. And so he looked at that woman, and don't get me wrong, he had compassion for her. And he had concern for her. But he said, woman, 
Behold thy son, as he pointed to John. And then as he looked at John, he said, John, behold thy mother. He made sure she would be taken care of physically, but when he spoke to her just as a woman, he was showing her not only did he care about her physical provision, he cared about her spiritual provision. It's not mama and son, it is sinner and savior. And as he shed his blood that day, he not only shed it for those by the name of Peter. He not only shed it for those by the name of James Smith. He not only shed it for those by your name, but he also shed it for that little woman who was named Mary, who as a virgin gave birth to the precious Lamb of God. Amen. Amen? So, nothing but the blood can purchase the sinner. Listen, friends, as I've said, this gives us the truth that sinners, and all of us are sinners, need redemption. Now, why? Why do we need redemption? Well, first of all, because we are all slaves to sin. Romans 3, 28, for we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 10, Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3, John chapter 8, verse 44, we have all been slaves to sin. We are slaves to sin. And then secondly, because we are lost and we are separated from God. Isaiah 59 verse 2. Our iniquity has separated us from God. What iniquity? Our our lying? Well, no. Do you realize lying isn't, stealing isn't, murder isn't, cussing isn't the sin that separates us? That's just the fruit that hangs on the tree. The tree that has separated us is rejection and rebellion of God and we are separated from Almighty God. Isn't that right? Also, we need a Savior, need redemption because we we are all hell bound and we are hopeless apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. Psalms chapter 9 and verse 17. Only the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ offers the redemption that sinners need. When you look at it and study it in the Word of God, over in Romans chapter 6 and verse 14, we are shown that Jesus' blood frees us from sin's power. Then as you study the Word of God and look at Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9, you see that Jesus' blood brings us into fellowship with God the Father. And then as you look at the Word of God at Romans again, in chapter 5 and verse 1, you see that Jesus' blood gives us peace and assurance. I've got the assurance of knowing that I'm going to heaven, not because of my works, not because of my good deeds, but because of His shed blood. Amen? It paid the price. And then as you look at Romans chapter 5, verse 9 again, and then Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9 through 14, you'll see that His blood changes our eternal destiny. It won't be soul sleeping. It won't be hell. I'm headed to glory. What about you? Because of his shed blood. Try whatever you will. Try using your morals. Try using your heritage. Try using your works. Try using your rituals. Try using whatever it is you want to. Only the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ makes a human being ready for heaven. Only the blood. Only the blood. Those who are saved can sing that song of redemption. They can enjoy the the knowledge of knowing that they are eternally saved through the blood of Jesus. Amen? So, we learn from Peter here that nothing but the blood can produce a Savior. Nothing but the blood can purchase the sinner. And then lastly, nothing but the blood can purify from sin. Look at verse 22 of our passage. It says, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfringed love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. The first part is what's important there. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth. Now, now what is the truth? The truth is the Word of God tells us we're sinners. We're all sinners, right? 
Not a one of us has escaped it. We're all sinners, isn't it right? And the truth tells us that we must confess our sin. We must acknowledge it, isn't that right? But before God can ever do anything for us, we must agree with God, isn't that right? And God says we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God, and we have to acknowledge that. We have to acknowledge He's true, He's right. Amen? And then He says that we must also believe the truth that His Son Jesus is God come in the flesh. Isn't that right? And that His Son Jesus, God who come in the flesh, is the Savior and Redeemer of all mankind. Isn't that right? That there's only one. Jesus says that no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Isn't that right? And then we must believe the truth that the Word of God says that Jesus, who came into the, the world, put on flesh as God, and is the Savior of mankind, that He died on a cross. He didn't just wooze on the cross. He died. Okay? They drove nails through His hands, probably really through this part right here. And they drove nails through his feet. And then, my friends, after a period of time to make sure that he was dead, because when they came, they came to break his legs so that he would go ahead and immediately suffocate. And when they got to him, they said he was already dead. So what did they do? They stuck a spear in his side. And according to medical history, that they stuck it in so deep that it, perm it went through the sack around the heart, and so therefore water and blood came, coming, came out. That means that the heart was punctured, blood came out of there, the sack around the heart was punctured, that's where the liquid fluid came out. So, my friends, you don't live when that water escapes and when that heart's punctured and blood comes out. Those of you who are in the medical field, am I not right? Is that not right? That's exactly right. That's what they t tell us. And so we have to believe that Jesus shed His blood, not because He was a thief, but because He was a Savior. And then we have to understand and believe also what we're told over in that priestly book of the book of Hebrews where it says, without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness, there is no taking away, there is no getting rid of sin without the shedding of blood. Isn't that right? So that's what we're being told right here. We have purified our souls simply because by faith we have accepted the truth of God's plan and God's Savior. Amen? Friends, listen. Verse 22 declares that obedience to that truth of God's Word purifies man's soul from sin. Now, that truth must be uh, taken in obedience in order to be saved. I have explained that to you, faith in Jesus being God's only begotten Son, faith in Jesus' sinless life on earth, faith in Jesus' death for life and, uh, for sinful man, and faith in Jesus being resurrected from the dead, and faith in Jesus' shed blood for man. The shedding of blood uh, for, as a sin payment has always been God's plan. Go back to the book of Genesis, the very beginning of where we have recorded history of the things that God wants us to know. Over in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21, whenever Adam and Eve rebelled against God and disobeyed God, how did God take care of their sin? He shed blood. God killed an animal, did He not? Now you say, well, it doesn't say He killed an animal. Well, it does because it says He took a skin, an animal skin, and covered their nakedness. Isn't that right? Now do you tell me, if you can get a skin off of an animal without killing it. You hear me? You may be good, but you ain't that good. You hear me? And then also, let's go back to Genesis again. Not only did he shed blood at that time, but just come up another chapter. Genesis chapter 4, verses 2 through 4. There was two young guys that were born to, to uh, uh, this family. And there, my friends, it was Cain and it was Abel. And whenever they came to worship God, one brought a blood sacrifice and one brought the product of his own hands. And what did God do? The product of the boy's hands, God re rejected it, did he not? But the blood sacrifice, God received it, did he not? Why? Because God had already set the standard. There must be the shedding of blood. Come on up a little further. 
to the book of Genesis, chapter 8, verses 20 through 21. There was a man by the name of Noah. After the flood, do you know what Noah did under the inspiration of Almighty God? He built an altar and those clean animals that were put to safety in the, in, in the ark with Noah and his family, they were sacrificed to Almighty God. There was blood that was shed. You hear me? So, God has always said there must be the shedding of blood. Nothing but the blood can purify us from sin. We've got to get over this thing that I can turn over a leaf good enough that God will accept it. He will not. Only Jesus' blood. Friend, when, when God gave worship guidelines in the Word of God to the Jewish people, He demanded blood. Take your Bibles and turn over to the book of Leviticus. Leviticus. And look with me at Leviticus chapter 4 and then again at Leviticus chapter 17. I'll let you get those two places. Leviticus chapter 4. The book of Leviticus is where God sets out the, uh, the ordinances of worship, of sacrifices, what he will receive and what he will reject. Look at Leviticus 4 verse 4 and verse 5. And he shall bring the bullock unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord, and shall lay his hand upon the bullock's head, and kill the bullock before the Lord. And the priest that is anointed shall take of the bullock's blood, and bring it to the tabernacle of the congregation. Now he'll eventually take it on into the Holy of Holies, and pour that blood upon the mercy seat, will he not? Under that mercy seat is found what? Aaron's bud and rod, a bowl of manna, but also what? The broken law. When that blood goes over it, God no longer sees the broken law. Look at Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11. Our nurses, and those of you who are in the uh, medical profession, will give a, a testament to this truth right here. You, uh, you take a man or a woman or a boy or a girl and you uh, drain all the blood out of them. They're still just very healthy and very much alive, aren't they? Now they're dead, that's right. Listen to what God says. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. Isn't that amazing? He didn't have a degree in cardiology. He wasn't a vascular person. He was just God. But listen to what he said. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. God cannot lie. Amen. Now understand this. With all of the millions of gallons of blood that was shed over those many, many hundreds of years before Calvary ever took place. My friends, I, I, I've read someplace in some of my books that whenever they had the Day of Atonement, that the, uh, the animals that were brought and sacrificed on the altar there at the, uh, uh, the tabernacle or even at the temple, that the blood, that there were so many animals, that, that the blood was run so much that it would run off of the temple mound down to Kenrod uh, Valley and fill the stream up. And it would take literally weeks before the water would ever clear up. And you, t you just think about the thousands.